Hi, I'm Don from Don Drones On. Today we're going to dive into a document Nav Canada published late in 2023 called the RPAS Traffic Management RTM System Concept of Operations. That's quite a mouthful, but an interesting perspective into the world of drones in 2030. And yes, Remote ID plays a role in their view of the future. Let's dive in. The RPAS Traffic Management RTM system, Concept of Operations, or CONOPS for short, is a 35 page doc document. Oh, wait, that's not it. Here it is over here. Prepared by Nav Canada's RPAS Traffic Management team in collaboration with Transport Canada's RPAS Task Force. And yes, before you ask, the document not only has a title, but also an actual date, December the 1st, 2023, and Alan Chapman, head of the RTM team, is listed as the contact for questions and comments. So yeah, accountability, love it. Now, seeing an old DJI Spark on the cover is funny though. I had one of those many years ago and absolutely hated it, but that's just me. So what the heck is a concept of operations, you may well be asking. A concept of operations is a type of formal systems analysis where you describe how a system works from the perspective of the various users of the system. Fancy pants words for a white paper or straw man, but all good. The document is nicely structured, professionally written, and intentionally positioned as a work in progress, openly inviting feedback. Now I say professionally written, but that doesn't mean it's a breeze to go through. Here's a classic sentence I pulled out. The RFIMS architecture will be developed based on the concepts of centralized RFIMS capabilities, working together with various RSPs, which provide the direct support to RPAS operators. Yeah, it's full of jargon and is a thick, creamy acronym soup. In fact, RSP is a triple layer cake of acronyms, standing for RTM service providers, with RTM standing for RPAS traffic management and RPAS, of course, short for remotely piloted aircraft systems. So if you're comfortable with that level of writing, fill your boots and read it. There's a link in the description down below. Otherwise, well, stick to easier stuff like war and peace. <laughs> the CONOPS document is intended to describe how drones of all shapes and sizes will fit into Canada's air traffic management system in 2030 and refreshingly does so with something other than a one size fits all approach. In fact, they outline eight different types of operations and seven different airspace environments, some of which require, well, just sunshine and a full belly and others may require a form of remote ID. But before we get into that, let's back up just a bit. Early in the document, they make an interesting statement. Transport Canada and Nav Canada are committed to extending to RPAS the principle of providing fair and equitable access to airspace. That's a pretty important principle, fair and equitable access to airspace. And it's good to see it stated, even if you might think that's far from today's reality. Getting into the meat of the document, they start to talk about something called the RTM ecosystem a combination of organizations, users, tools, and data systems that together will provide drone flight planning, authorization, tracking, conflict resolution, weather services, and more. Think of it as the nav drone environment, including its backend systems today on steroids. Lots and lots and lots of steroids. Here's two examples to help decipher this diagram. Simple one first. If a recreational drone user on the far right needs authorization to fly in controlled airspace, they go through an RTM service provider here, NavDrone in the current world, which in turn reaches into the brains of the system called the RPAS Flight Information Management System or RFIMS. RFIMS would serve as a central system for pulling in airspace definitions, drone info, and everything in between, and then hand back the RPAS authorization, or not, to the RSP, which would communicate to the user. 
the user experience would be similar to today's NavDrone authorization. Well, hopefully a lot better. A more complicated example might be a BVLOS pipeline inspection mission, where the RPAS operator may need to use a special detect and avoid system and may be required to have a network identifier, also known as remote ID, in order to fly their mission. Again, the RFIMS would analyze the request, perhaps interact with the traditional airspace management system, and feed a response back through the appropriate RSP. This kind of system architecture is designed to be flexible and scalable. It's not crazy, although my spidey sense gets a bit itchy when I hear about highly centralized systems, particularly in a country with huge communication blackout zones. And that will be one of the key challenges as Nav Canada develops this system over the next few years. One interesting detail is that the architecture shows multiple RTM service providers and specifically mentions that these RTM service providers could be third parties. In fact, one of their architectural principles is that the system be open, meaning it would be designed for third parties to interoperate with other parts of the ecosystem as long as they follow the appropriate protocols. And guess what? That means tools like Drone Pilot Canada may finally be allowed to manage flight authorization requests. Finally. Oh wait, in, in six years, by 2030. Now, obviously this whole system isn't being designed just to cater to the needs of recreational drone pilots, but at least we are recognized as a user group. I mentioned earlier that they've defined eight different RPAS operation types based upon how the flights are flown, as shown in this table. The first type is called hand flown VLOS, with the examples being real estate photography and recreational flight in a field. I think they said in a field to be inclusive of RC aircraft pilots, but you get the point. We're on their radar. Well, if you excuse the expression. Recreational activities are also mentioned as part of multi RPAS here at the bottom. Recreational RPAS gathering. It's great to see this as a use case being considered. The other operation types are point to point, where the path may be variable, fixed path, where you're doing, say, a pipeline inspection or something like that, investigative for things like wildfire surveillance, grid for agriculture, surveying, or search and rescue, surveillance for law enforcement, and holding for remote Wi-Fi services. Now, it's kind of a curious categorization. For example, differentiating between the investigative and surveillance categories seems a bit arbitrary to me. But this, like everything in the document, is open to comments and discussion. In addition to the dimension of operation type, the document also goes into a lot of detail about carving up RPAS airspace into seven different types listed here. The first two more or less correspond to airspace accessible to basic and advanced RPAS pilots today. And the third one aligns with the low risk BVLOS stuff covered in the new regulations proposed to launch in 2025. The last four are what they call overlays to cover specific situations, such as a segregated airspace exclusively for hospital to hospital human organ delivery, for example. That kind of airspace might only be active at certain times and could restrict traditional aircraft from entry when it is operational. Each of these airspace types has a full page like this one describing the airspace, the kind of services required from the RTM service providers, and illustrative use cases. The good news is that in airspace that recreational and small commercial operators would play in, the first two on the list, there is no requirement for remote ID or any other form of electronic conspicuity. This is really good news and sensible as well. Now, electronic conspicuity does start to appear, optionally at least, for the low-risk BVLOS stuff. Then in the segregated case, it shows up as network ID forwarding, which isn't very well defined, unfortunately. In the RTM cooperative airspace, a conspicuity device is required for both RPAS and traditional aircraft, which is an interesting requirement. And then in the RTM non 
cooperative case, suddenly the term conspicuity device is changed to simply remote ID, and it is required only for the RPAS in the airspace. Now, I'm not sure if they deliberately chose the term remote ID for this case, as, a, as opposed to the more generic electronic conspicuity, or they just missed it in the editing process. After all, that term remote ID is like a lightning rod for many of us watching it play out so poorly in the US. It will be interesting to see if it sticks around in later editions of the document. Regardless, it's encouraging to see remote ID or electronic conspicuity only being mentioned in these more complex airspace scenarios and not being proposed for every Tom, Dick and Harry flying a drone. While it could be a slippery slope, so far it is positioned sensibly. So there we have it, the Nav Canada straw man, oops, I mean concept of operations for RPAS traffic management in Canada in the near to medium term future. It's meant to be a starting point, open for comments and questions. So if you don't mind taking a long warm bath in acronym soup, have a close read and provide feedback to Alan Chapman, owner of the document. And yes, DPAC will be involved to some extent, at least to ensure that the recreational and small commercial use cases are properly heard. Thanks for watching. Safe and happy flying.